For the first time in WWE history, we find ourselves without a McMahon in charge of the former New York Territory. I'm not here to get into the ins and outs of current affairs, shall we say, but given that we're at the end of the McMahon era, I'd say it's a good time to look at how the McMahons even got into pro wrestling. This is the story of how it all started with Jess McMahon. First off, Jess is a nickname, and for clarity, his name was not Jessica. His birth name was Roderick James McMahon, and he was born on October 29, 1882 in Manhattan, New York. Roderick's parents had come from Galway in Ireland. The McMahons had become American citizens in the late 1860s. To give you a perspective on why this was, we need to do a little history. Between 1845 and 1870, more than two million Irish immigrants had arrived in New York City. There's a multitude of reasons, including the promise of land ownership and greater religious freedom. But also it's notable that this mass migration of the Irish peaked during the Great Famine of 1845 to 1852. The Irish were fleeing these difficult conditions that had been brought on in large part by the British for a better life in the United States. So as the Irish immigrants sailed towards freedom, they would for the first time see Lady Liberty in the New York Harbour, and many of them would make the boroughs of New York their home. There was an entrepreneurial spirit to the Irish immigrants of the time, an entrepreneurial spirit that led Jess and Edward's father to become a hotel owner. I did a little bit of a deep dive on which hotels the McMahons actually ran during this time, so here's what I found. On one of the naturalization index forms from the time that I found, there was the address of Roderick McMahon I, the father of Jess and Edward McMahon. The address was simply put as Manhattanville. That's rather vague, thankfully. There's another naturalization form in there that shows his address as 142 West 41st. That's around five miles out of Manhattanville, so it's close enough, I guess. Maybe they lived in multiple places. What took me out, though, is that when I googled the address, it showed me the iconic Knickerbocker Hotel in Times Square. So at first I thought the Knickerbocker was the hotel the McMahons owned. Turns out that the Knickerbocker only opened in 1906. Roderick I was already a hotel owner when Jess McMahon, a.k.a. Roderick II, was born. A little more digging and I solved the mystery before the Knickerbocker occupied that site. There was another hotel that stood there called the Hotel St. Cloud. Guess when it was opened? 1868. The same year that Roderick McMahon I became a United States citizen. The only picture I could find of the hotel during this time is a photo of the Rossmore Hotel circa 1885. On the left, you can see what I believe to be the Hotel St. Cloud that at the time the McMahons were in charge of. Can I get a like for my detective work on that one? Sorry for the brag there. I've just literally seen no one else that's written about this topic present that information. So I'm a little proud of finding it. Jess and Edward McMahon would take after their father's entrepreneurial spirit. It's interesting how in every generation of McMahon from Roderick McMahon, the first to Vince Jr., the entrepreneurial business sense has been passed from father to son. With a diploma from Manhattan College under his belt at 17, Jess and his brother Edward would forego a career in banking, which they had been earmarked for in favor of promoting and managing sports teams, including founding the New York Lincoln Giants, a black baseball team, and the Commonwealth Big Five, which was a black basketball team. At the time, for context, sports were segregated by race. It was a very different time. The McMahon brothers' true strength was in promoting boxing. In 1915, whilst touring with the Lincoln Stars, which was one of their teams, they went to Havana in Cuba and co-promoted a 45-round fight between Jess Willard and Jack Johnson. The McMahon brothers had name recognition and goodwill established in Harlem at the time. They opened up the Commonwealth Casino on East 135th Street, Madison Avenue in Harlem. It served as a venue for many of their sporting events, including basketball and boxing. They would see successes in all these ventures, including the Commonwealth Big Five winning world championships in 1923 and 1924. When they booked boxing events, they would cater to the growing black population in Harlem. They became savvy to the fact that fights between black and white fighters drew the largest crowds, given the diversity of those in attendance. This was breaking the mold of what the norm seemed to be with athletics and sports at the time in America. I don't want to give them some sort of credit for being progressive for the time. Whilst that may be a good story, chances are the McMahon brothers were only cared about the color green and therefore whatever was best for business, they would adapt to accordingly. Regardless of their intention, the McMahon-owned team the Commonwealth Big Five served as inspiration for Robert Douglas who would form the New York Renaissance Big Five in 1923, which was the first black-owned, fully professional African-American basketball team. There's a lot of sports promotion the McMahon brothers did during this time, 
but it was in 1932 that Jess would begin to promote professional wrestling at the Freeport Municipal Stadium in Long Island. He didn't know it at the time, but he just started a narrative that would play out for over a century. It's amazing how just another one of Jess McMahon's business ventures in 1932 became a global phenomenon that would break records in entertainment creating icons both in and out of the ring. All of it comes from this moment. At the time, there was a sort of turf battle that was taking place in New York's wrestling scene as various promoters vied for venues and attention for their events. Jess was walking into a battlefield, so he formed a partnership with Carlos Henriquez, who was a competitive wrestler with some contacts in the biz. Carlos Henriquez managed to book events at the Brooklyn Sports Stadium and the Coney Island Stadium, big venues to put on a wrestling show. Business was picking up for wrestling in general at the time as it had barely shifted from a legitimate competition to a shoot at this point. During the 1920s, a group of wrestling pioneers known as the Gold Dust Trio had control over the pro wrestling industry. However, their dissolution in 1928 had made it open season for promoters trying to take over the now exponentially expanding wrestling business. The business was going from carnival shows and county fairs to stadiums, and Jess McMahon was going to make the most of that opportunity. Through his alliance with Henriquez, Jess McMahon was able to sign prominent wrestlers of the time like Gino Garibaldi, Jim Browning and Mike Romano amongst others. So needless to say, Jess was doing well in the wrestling business and would have a long career promoting wrestling and other events. Eventually, Jess would meet the old guard of wrestling, who had opened the door for one of his most successful business ventures. Jess would meet Toots Mont, a pivotal member of the Gold Dust Trio, who had revolutionized the wrestling industry and turned wrestlers into stars. During the 1940s, Toots Mont had commenced his takeover of the New York wrestling scene as a promoter, expanding his promotion with Ray Fabiano. However, initially, his takeover was unsuccessful, as rival New York promoter Jack Curley was preventing them from promoting in New York. Jack Curley had previously worked with the McMahon brothers, promoting that Willard and Johnson fight I mentioned. But after being squeezed out of the boxing game, he focused his ambitions on professional wrestling and basically became the king of wrestling in New York at the time. Curley had something of a stranglehold on New York wrestling at the time. Despite some setbacks, he had maintained a healthy level of success through the 1920s and early 1930s. However, it was in 1937 that he would pass away, leaving a power vacuum in the New York wrestling scene. As Jack Curley lay on his deathbed, Toots Mont pondered the implications for the New York wrestling scene, realizing that without Curley, the entire industry was prone to falling apart. Toots Mont would enlist the help of several promoters, one of which was Jess McMahon. This was the era where you see them finally gain access to Madison Square Garden, which is an arena that would become the spiritual homeland of the WWE. The story goes that Toots Mont and Jess McMahon together formed the Capital Wrestling Corporation, which is the earliest ancestor to what is now known as the WWE. There's also some who say that Jess didn't found the CWC and that by then it was Vince McMahon Sr., Jess's son who was working with Mont. WWE themselves credit Jess as the founder of the CWC, so I guess if anyone would know it would be them. Unfortunately, almost two years after the CWC was founded, Jess McMahon would pass away on November 21, 1954 at the age of 72, leaving behind his son Vince McMahon Sr. to take the reins. That's a story for a whole different video. I think Jess McMahon's story is interesting because it has echoes and hints towards what the McMahon family would become. To go from Roderick McMahon, the first who was an 1800s hotel-owning Irish immigrant, all the way to Vince Jr., is a hell of a lineage. The whole story is interesting to ponder in my opinion, especially now it's come to an end with the family business for the first time in 100 years no longer being a family business. I mean Stephanie's still involved and Vince's son-in-law is the boss. So it's hardly like the McMahon family run is completely over but the father to son male lineage has now come to an end. Anyway thanks for watching another Sarcastic Mark video, hope you liked it. History deep dives can get pretty wild, subscribe and all that good stuff. See you next time.